Hello, and welcome to Cruising Through History. I'm Xander Miller, and I'm sitting down with Scott Cruz. Scott, where are we cruising through today? Well, today, Xander, I'm going to talk about the racial integration of professional football. Okay, and so when you say football, let's get this out of the way now. <laughs> football, American football, yes. right? Okay. Yeah. And interesting a lot, interestingly enough, sorry, uh, we all know the story of the integration of baseball because we all know Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. 1947, and the things Robinson had to go through uh, when they did that. But football actually integrated in 1946, a year before um, Jackie Robinson had played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm -hmm. So uh, the interesting part of this is there were actually four players who signed in 1946. Uh, uh, their names were Kenny Washington, Woody Strode, Marion Motley, and Bill Willis. And Washington and Strode were actually teammates at UCLA. And they played on the football team with, ironically enough, Jackie Robinson. Wow, really? Jackie Robinson played football too? Mm -hmm. Okay. He was quite the athlete. And so that's why he, he was quite the baseball player. But ironically, Washington, some considered Washington a better baseball player than Robinson because they both played on the UCLA baseball team as well. In fact, there's a story that Leo DeRozier, who was the manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, who would actually become Robinson's manager, um, he, wanted, he wanted to offer Washington a contract but he wanted Washington to play in Puerto Rico first, and Washington wouldn't, so then that kind of died. So. Okay. So, so how did this happen and then not be as big of a deal? Like, well, I it is, yeah, I wondered about that, because when, when I was researching this story, I was finding all these different interesting strands that ran through it. The Robinson one was one of them. In fact, um, it was very rare to have three, uh, they all played in the backfield, which is like running back and that for, for the UCLA. It was rare to have three African-American players as it was. Mm -hmm. So what happened is this, this, the Cleveland Rams, that's what they were called at the time, in 1946, they moved to Los Angeles and they became the Los Angeles Rams and we all know the Los Angeles Rams are playing in the Super Bowl, so. <laughs> but that's how the Rams became the Los Angeles Rams. But when they moved there, uh, some people in the community saw this as a way to start demanding integration and one, this is really smart of them, one of the tools they used was they argued that if you're going to play in the LA Coliseum, which is still there, that was built with taxpayer money, both black and white. Oh yeah. So that's a facility that's built by taxpayers, that's a public facility you can't you should, well, at the time they probably could have if they wanted, you should integrate the team because it's paid for by both. So they use that argument. And, and this isn't, I hear that argument, I'm, I think, wow, that's like the 60s sit-ins where they, where they right. say, this is a public place, you know, we can be here, right. we legally can be here, but this is in the 40s. This is yes, yeah. And it was really spearheaded by um, uh, the sports editor of the Los Angeles Tribune, who was himself African-American, and he had played in the Negro Leagues. His name was William Clare Harding. And he kind of did the journalist part of this where he was really being the bushes for this to, to happen. And he did a lot with that. So, so it did, and they hired, uh, uh, hired, sorry. <laughs> they signed Washington and Strode, I think, in about uh, March of 46. Now, meanwhile, where this gets kind of interesting is, so Cleveland doesn't have a team now. Well, they, they are about to get one because there was this thing called the All-America Football Conference, which was about to form. And so they replaced the Cleveland Rams and they became the Cleveland Browns. Now they were named after their coach, Paul Brown, who coached at Ohio State. And one thing that Paul Brown was, was he believed in integration as well. Because mm -hmm. even at the high school level, when he coached in Ohio, he had African Americans on his football team and he had them in college. And one of them was Bill Willis, who he signed to this contract uh, to play for the Browns. Now, I, I guess you could argue and say, well, this All-America Football Conference wasn't the NFL. Well, it only lasted for like three years. And then the Cleveland team, the Browns, were one of their most successful teams. So they became part of the NFL. That's how that happened. 
a lot of origin stories going on here. So it's like different leagues for these teams, really. Right, but it's still professional. Football. Yeah. It just, I mean, we, we think of NFL as professional football, but there's, <laughs> there's different leagues of professional, like different right. levels. And, and on the West Coast, there was a thing called the Pacific Coast Professional Football League. Now, that was considered like the highest of minor leagues, so it would almost be like a AAA in baseball. Well, the reason that's, in, that's important is because they had a team called the Hollywood Bears. And uh, Kenny Washington and Woody Strode both played on the Hollywood Bears. And briefly, Jackie Robinson played for the Hollywood Of course. Bears. We're just going to see Jackie <laughs> Robinson keep coming up, aren't we? Yeah. It, it'll come up a couple more times here. So they played in these leagues, and um, that's how – but they knew they couldn't play prof- – well, not professionally because that is professional football, but they knew they couldn't play in the NFL. And so the NFL had a gentleman's agreement, very similar to baseball, to keep African Americans out of the professional ranks. It didn't last as long. Baseballs was like, I don't know, many years until it changed. And it was because of an owner. His name was George Preston Marshall. And he entered the league in about 1932 or so, and he was the owner of a team called the Boston Redskins. Now, I know I'm using the terms they used then. Yeah, we're it's just but like we all the know, name it was. Exactly. So we all know where this is going because the Boston Redskins became the Washington Redskins. And they only played in Boston. They left Boston in 1937 and went to Washington. And so because of him, or because of his influence, that's why they... Uh, they kept, they kept it pretty much. They kept it whites only. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting about Washington is they were the last team to integrate 1962. And I don't think there's a connection. But what I found was the reason they integrated is because the Kennedy administration had threatened them with a, a civil rights suit because the stadium they were going to play in which was just called D.C. Stadium, mm-hmm. was owned by the federal government. Ooh, that's different. And it different. was managed by the Department of the Interior. So again, a public place. So they used this argument saying, you can't discriminate here. Even though you're private, you're using a public, a public building to do that. So I thought that was interesting. I don't think there's a connection, but it's sort of the same argument that they made in Los Angeles in the mid-'40s. Yeah, I'm almost wondering how these influence like a lot of the... Um, 60 civil rights movements because that arguments you know how they got to doing sit-ins essentially a lot of the time right and, I, and i'm saying you know i'm not saying you know everything was suddenly wonderful yeah for yeah these of guys course. of course because you know the general public is still you know for the most part but um yeah it, it, it's interesting that they use that argument um but there were some i guess in our in our case in that time we'd call them progressive thinkers mm-hmm. vince lombardi was one of them and in, in his team's he, in the 60s, when he was in Green Bay, he didn't tolerate a lot of any racism on the team. Mm-hmm. And actually, the Packers, when he got there, there was like one African-American player. By the late 60s, he had like 13 or 14 or 15. I mean, he had integrated the team. It doesn't sound like a lot now, but for then, yeah. you know, it was. Well, my that, that's it's funny you mention how you know it w- wouldn't have been an easy trip for them. I guess how was the public's response to that? Because to see their teams, then their teams in, if someone's there, their teams integrate and they right. see that. What what happened with the public response here? Well, Strode he actually talked about this because you know he he talked about being in L.A. and he never really experienced a lot of racism, maybe overtly to him. Yeah, and he he would always say you know. In, on the Pacific Coast, there wasn't anything we couldn't do. As we got out of the L.A. area, we found these racial tensions. And he even says, hell, we thought we were white <laughs> because they didn't get much of that. But when you hit the road, you did. In fact, um, the Cleveland Browns were scheduled to play a team called the Miami Seahawks in 1946. And they didn't make the trip because there had been threats against the lives of of the two African-American players, which Jeez. surprised me. And, um, and also the state of Florida had threatened that they were going to use this law that barred interracial sporting competitions. So they decided they weren't even just going to bother going down there because it would have just been... So there was some of that 
the NFL at that time wasn't as popular as baseball. Mm -hmm. I think that's why baseball grabs the imagination at that time in the 40s. Uh, the NFL isn't, wasn't even close to what we think of it as today. Um, so, and Woody Strode is a very interesting character. Um, he only played for like a year, mm -hmm. and then he was let go by the Rams. But a lot of these guys played in Canada, too. Canada, Jackie Robinson played in Montreal. <laughs> for the, he played for the Montreal Royals, I think it was. They were the minor league baseball team for the Dodgers before he played in Brooklyn. And so... I thought that connection was kind of funny, too. But Strode, even before, in 1936, he had uh, done a, well, they called it a nude portrait, but I think he had shorts on or something, <laughs> for, for this guy who was putting together these, uh, a photo exhibition for the 1936 Olympics held in Berlin. Well, the Nazis see this, and they shut it down because there's, black athletes and there's Jewish athletes. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, Strode catches the attention of Hitler. He, because Hitler's always, you know, the, the, the Superman and all this nonsense, you know, the, the Ubermenschen, whatever. So he sends Lenny Reifenstahl, who you may know as one of the propagandists for the Third Reich, um, to Los Angeles, and she sort of does this photo shoot with Strode. Now, Strode doesn't know who she is. It's afterwards, he's telling people about it, and then they start telling him who she is. Oh, uh, yeah. So he actually, she went back to L.A. to do some more work with him. He wouldn't work with her because he found out who she was. So he said, eh, eh. <laughs> But he's also very interesting because here's a little trivia. The character Woody in Toy Story is named after him. Really? Because after football, Strode had a very long acting career. I didn't know any of this until I was looking at it and I was like, wait, I've seen that guy before because I looked him up in Google to see his image. And I kept going, I've seen that guy in stuff before. And sure enough, I saw him in a Batman episode I was watching one day, the one from the 60s. So, so even though Strode didn't play football all that long, he was sort of instrumental, but they faced it. Yeah, that's still, to me, that's interesting to see integration so so early for for one but also even before baseball because um I, when I, I see stories or i'll see movies i remember a lot of childhood movies um that'll be racial tensions in football um yes especially and you know i see that and then i don't think about it too much i don't think about you know the history of right. how football actually became integrated i just see it as like oh there's well, racism racism exists. The movie takes place in like the '90s and the '80s or something <laughs> like that. Right. Um, but hearing that goes back to the '40s, um, mid late '40s, no doubt, too, post World War II. Right, and um, I think you just hit on something right there. World War II, I thought, I think was sort of a catalyst for some of this. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had talked about this during the Harlem Renaissance episode, and one of those things we talked about was how some of those black intellectuals said, no, these are your rights too. Yeah. You, you stand up for them. Don't, don't let anybody deny you those things. You fight for them. And, and so I think a lot of, of African-American soldiers, even though they served in segregated units and Japanese-American units too, which you know, even though they had, they had relatives in these camps, were still fighting for the United States. And mm -hmm. so I think they saw it as Hey, we were just over there fighting, and now I come home, and this happened. You know, I can't even go to here because I can't drink out of this fountain. It mm -hmm. all seemed kind of insane by then. And I mean, it was before, but now it seems really, really weird. And so, I think that was the case. Now, two of these players were in World War II: Woody Strode and uh, Marion Motley. They both served in in World War II, and so did Jackie Robinson. And what what happens here? <laughs> He's going to keep popping up still. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a, and, and Robinson was actually arrested uh, when he was in the Army because he got on a bus in Texas somewhere, and the Army bus lines had been integrated. You couldn't. There was no sitting in the back. And, mm -hmm. But for some reason, the bus driver made him sit in the back. And then if there was some kerfuffle, and so when they got... So he... He won, his, he, he won his point, so he sat where he wanted to sit. But unfortunately, when he got to the place, this guy had called the military police, 
I think this is July of 1944. And so, and then they were going to court martial him for all these. They, they charged him with all this stuff, public drunkenness, even though he doesn't drink. You know, they, they threw all these charges at him. But actually, about a month later, he was acquitted by an all white uh, panel. Because mm -hmm. even they said uh, they, they knew. But of course, where he was was Texas, and that probably wasn't a great place to be. So, so he experienced this during World War II. Now, these other guys didn't experience that, but I think the, the, the mere, you know, if you're going to, if we're fighting Hitler because he believes in a master race, mm -hmm. and we come home and we're second class citizens because people think there's a master race here, then what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think, I, I think we've talked about this before is post, post World War II, look at class of mm -hmm. people being. You know, we were literally fighting next to each other after a while because, I mean, at first it wasn't all integrated and they were like, why aren't we, we need people for one. <laughs> um, so right, right. now we're now we're here and we come back and I'm like, why? Um, why? Why is this a case? Bring that back to sports and mm -hmm. I, I, get, I guess when you're getting that similar team environment of people together for some form of purpose, right. whether it be war or playing football, I mean, this is what you get. Is you're going to get people fighting to be together like that. Right, exactly. And so, um, yeah, so that's how I see it. I see that there was this sort of catalyst. Now, again, there's still segregation. There's still these things. There's still terrible things. I mean, there's still terrible things now, but at least it was sort of a start. Yeah. You know, and so you get these things that kind of snowball. But I think you make a good point when you say team, when you talk about teams, because eventually what, what, uh, Robinson founded baseball and these men founded football was that for a lot of the stuff they faced and the terrible things that they were called after a while if they played well those things started to kind of just die out mm -hmm. because people were like at least their teammates would say think they would they would wouldn't bother anymore because they were good that was sort of the key too and and so um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, these guys pretty had much had thick skins. Now I don't know if they faced as much as Robinson faced, because he was alone. I mean, he was one person. But they faced enough. And uh, Marion Motley, though, he had a great quote about this, and he said, um, "And I'll clean it up a little because it's uh, <laughs> for our listening audience." But he was talking about the stuff that they would endure on the field and. Uh, one of them actually talked about how they would hear these insults constantly, and guys would be trying to spike them and you know, step on their feet, stuff with their spike, and the refs would just stand there. You know, the refs wouldn't do anything. But he, he said, um, this is a quote from Marion Motley, they found out that, that, that while they were calling us the N-word and alligator bait, I was running for touchdowns, and Willis was knocking the blank out of them. So they stopped calling us names and started trying to catch up with us. <laughs> right. I, that's a, that feels like it's a, one of those very, um, it's a very almost American value sort of phrase because I'm remembering those football movies and forgive me, I'm forgetting all of the names of them because <laughs> it, it has seriously been like 20 years, so 19 years since I've actually like sat and watched these films. But that's usually the like, eventual solution to the problems that you know none of our our differences aren't the things that people are here to see when they're at a football game they're here to see our team win they, right and it's also it's score. sort of a great irony too that you have people even today that are big football fans and let's say they go to the game and they cheer their team on and then they go home and call someone a racial name. It's like there's like some disconnect. Like, oh no, this is our team. Mm -hmm. They still identify with the team. It's just an interesting concept. So, uh, but yeah, it, it, so these these things went on, and but it got a little better. Like I said, even in the '60s, there were some. Uh, but Paul Brown, he was sort of a, a lead. But what what you got was this could have happened earlier because in 1940, George Hallis, who was the coach of the Bears. He saw this Kenny Washington play in a college all-star game, and he wanted desperately to sign him. Now, you hear these stories, too, that they, these coaches see these players. They want to sign him so badly. And uh, he tried to convince the league to drop this, this, this restriction they had, and they wouldn't. 
So maybe the Chicago Bears would have been the first integrated team if this would have happened. And it's the same thing in baseball. I know I keep talking, we're talking about football, but, but they're kind of on this similar track. But in baseball, uh, there's a story about John McGraw, who was this a coach from the turn of the 20th century into like the 1920s and 30s. And when he died, they were going through his personal things. They found a shoebox, and he had a list of names of African-American baseball players that he wished he could have signed. Wow. And because of this thing, they didn't, because of this, this gentleman's agreement, which I'm always sort of leery of that, <laughs> that name, which kept blacks out of baseball for so long. And uh, I think there were a lot of people like McGraw who wished they could have, but they just, they just couldn't. And the ownership would never budge. And the relationship between owners and management and players is nothing like, I mean, it's still contentious today, but then it was, it's nothing like it was today. So mm-hmm. the players had very little, little power. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's interesting. And, and, you know, as we get to the 60s, we were talking about Vince Lombardi. Well, there's a famous thing that happened with him. In the late 60s, one of his players was dating a white woman. Ooh. In the 60s? Yes. That didn't fly very far. Yeah, for um, everyone else, I just made a face like in the 60s. <laughs> um, okay. So his name was Lionel Aldridge, and he had gone to Utah State, and this is where he met. And they would become, they would get married. They would become married. Mm-hmm. Um, he met his wife. Her name was Vicky. And, um, but he got called to Lombardi's office one day. And he said, uh-oh. You know, whenever you got called to his office, it was never good. Like going to the principal or something. So he sat down and... Uh, Lombardi had said, well, you know, I heard this, that some of the players have said that you're in an interracial relationship. And he thought, oh, no, because some other players had tried this, and the NFL has basically kind of blackballed them because I know we, sorry I used that phrase, but that's what they described it as. They were sort of persona non grata. Yeah, they were blacklisted, taken yes, off of everything. that's what I meant to say. I apologize for the other, <laughs> other phrase. And so... Um, so he thinks this is what's going to happen to him, and Lombardi says, no, you get married, you let me worry about the rest of it. And Lombardi did this a lot. I don't think people know that about his character. We know, we know sort of the stern part of it, but we don't know about how he, he never tolerated a lot. He always said, my players, I don't see, they're not black or white, they're pack or green. You know, and there were other players that said, "Yeah, he treated us all the same, like dogs." You know, <laughs> the kind of <laughs> jokes like that. You know? so, oh gosh, that's good. <laughs> but yeah, so, so it was. So they played for a while, and a- after a while, I don't think, but I don't think they ever. They sort of played, and then kind of went on to their own lives after that. They became businessmen, or or in. I think Kenny Washington worked for the LAPD for years, and. Strode went into acting and did this, had this big, long acting career. And Strode always thought that he got, the reason he was never re-signed with the Rams is because he, he married a Hawaiian woman in 1947 or 48. But mm, I don't know. So, I mean, they signed him first. <laughs> so, but but uh, Strode didn't contribute much. I think he had injuries. Kenny Washington, in fact, Kenny Washington still has the uh, record for the longest run for a touchdown for the Rams, 92 yards. I think that record record still holds. And and Marion Motley and Bill Willis had great good careers too. And then they just went on to life after that, like anybody. Wow. It's interesting that they just kind of moved like they just went on in their life um, after Right. It, it is it's just odd to me that maybe this is why they're not remembered. Because <laughs> when I was looking at it, I think there's so many interesting things here. It's like yeah, I've never even heard half of these things. Well, it's like um, when I, th- I think of, um, I, I know more of civil rights movement, and the, na- the names that come up are generally people that then died um, <laughs> right. afterwards, which, right. I mean, it sounds really um, really morbid, but right. and I think, people died. And people I think, did die. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head if all four of them are, well, Strode isn't, but I do know some of them are in the Football Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I think Bill Willis is, and so uh, yeah, it is. It's interesting because it just they just kind of played and then went on. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it was like a big deal for their like I guess managers and higher ups, but really 
publicly, what did what did people see? They saw someone in you know, the, like kind of mentioned, they saw someone in uh, Packer Green. Um, they didn't see once they were on the field. That wasn't as and big. I of think a deal. that's how fans see it. Even though they may do other things in their personal lives, there's sort of this dissonance that you know that's our team. Mm -hmm. So you're on our team now. So you know it's all good. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting story. And the fact um, I didn't, I thought of this a while back because there is a book. This is the only book I've ever found on this subject, and it's fairly new. It's called The Forgotten First, uh, Kenny Washington, Woody Strode, Marion Motley, Bill Willis, and the Breaking of the NFL Color Barrier, uh, written by Keyshawn Johnson, himself a football player. Some of, our, some of our listeners may know that name. He played at USC, and he was a receiver. And, so, and he has a co-writer with this. So one day it came through. I, order, I saw it, and I ordered it. I think it's from last year. And I thought... I never knew about that. <laughs> and so when I was thinking about this, I thought that'd be an interesting story to tell because they are they are kind of forgotten. We don't really know that. We see what the sport is now. And like and, and it's not to this isn't a competition like, well, you know, we all know about Jackie Robinson, but we, no, because Robinson had to deal with I think a lot more flack mm -hmm. in a lot of ways in baseball because that was still like the American sport. So uh so, yeah, and I also think that you had all these different things going on, especially World War II, but you do see a lot of things spin out of that, and I think it's because of the experience that some of these people had. Yeah. That, wait, why are we fighting Hitler if we can't do these things? You know, we can't do a thing here. You know, and some things that seem kind of strange to us now, were, they weren't strange then, especially like an interracial relationship. That Even that was a bridge too far for a lot of people in, in that era. So Yeah, and I, when I hear all this, I'm... I was thinking that all these things are connected in some way, shape, or form. Because even this, the integration here is some is somewhat connected to World War II. Um, when you said um, that the, gosh, what was her name? Part of the Third Reich. The um, oh, Lenny Reifenstahl. Yeah, when they visited Hitler's filmmaker, as I like to call it. When they when she visited, like that connects directly to Hitler and World War II, and knowing right who that is. But this kind of the same methods, the same thought processes of, you know, this space, this arena is the people's arena, which, you know, right. public tax dollars, right. that same kind of thought process going into the 60s and then going to the movies that we've seen as kids. Right. So, and it, right. was like, and it wow. wasn't uh, long after World War II that the uh, armed forces were finally integrated by mm -hmm. Harry Truman. So the, even, even that changed because I think during all during World War II, they were segregated units. I think Roosevelt was afraid to do it at the time, but Truman could do it after the war. Yeah. So, so, so even that started to change. Now, did it suddenly, magically, things go away? Of course not. We know that. Yeah. But at least it was sort of a, a baby step or a step going in the right direction. Yeah. And there's, I mean, integration and civil rights as a whole was a series of baby steps, really. Yeah. Um, there's a series of baby steps until there's big leaps. Um, yeah. So... I mean, that's, if that's how it has to be, that's going to be how it's be. But that's history for you. Right. And it, it's interesting to me that they, they sort of took, they played and they deal, dealt with these insults. But they, they don't, I don't really hear a lot of them like fighting back or, or not fighting back, but really responding. And Robinson was told the same thing, like try to keep your cool for a couple of years and then, and then, then you can start lashing back at people, which he did. And I don't blame him. I mean, if I had a list of things people say, things like that. You know, I might feel differently too. So, yeah. So Scott, that talking integration this time and and football, where 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 do you think we're cruising through through next time? Uh, this is totally different than this topic was. Oh gosh, does it have New York involved? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about a man named Montague Parker and his 1909 expedition to find the Ark of the Covenant. And yes, it's sort of like Indiana Jones. I was going to say, Indiana Jones is like, are we talking a movie here? Or, okay. It's kind of like that. So it's, it's kind of off the path of what we were doing today. But, but there you go. All right. That's awesome. Cool. Oh, hey, Scott. Did you know that listeners can actually contact us now? They can. How can they do that? Yeah, they can just email us at um, historycruise at mykpl.info. Great. Also, like and subscribe.